Just a little quote, right? RP, coke, right? RP, 24. I can make cool 50 can let's 24 out. Rhyme with the pack through 10 C mounts. Feed me in socks and elite three rounds. I'm thumb through it, I don't need no counter. Had to reset for Taylor, been my neck on my John. I got oil, I got him, I got wax, I got flour. Burn on pre roll, free go Pluto. Drip real hard when I hop in that Tudor. I just made a socket that's plug named Hugo. Third lap, talk to my motherfucker, kind of white collar, got a nigga bond like Lonzo. D nigga overrated like Joe Flacco. Feeling like Jim Jones, nigga, I'm a copo. I'm flip roll around, feeling like Pop Smoke. Banana cream cake in my motherfucking hair wrap. Falling like Schmidt, then the pack gets sent back. Falling like an image, I push nigga shit back. Make a hat so I listen in the bank, be fast. Make a hat so I listen in the screen, be fast. All the shit talk, fake, getting they kidnapped. Jump now, you got that fin going lip dog. I'm here for the other magazine when I'm pissed off. My bitch hit it twice and then she went to sleep I drop butt on the clock with the perfect technique I'ma hit from the ride when grandma who beats I ain't got time in the day so my female be mad at me And in that rest I'ma run it up rapidly She know I'm vicious, I'm fucking her savagely She know I get right, she know my mentality Grew up in the trap, watch the coffee, yeah I'm on a nigga Pull up in the porch, yeah the pan on a nigga Yeah I pull up in the dodge, yeah the ram on a nigga Anybody try, yeah I'ma blame on niggas On the headband, got 50 them gray line Turn late, sun to a 5-5 hairline Always over dripping, I'm stung my own color line Got two chick, dog, I die for both mine I ain't no Satisfied too many increase, fuck the profile, too many increase. They be low key, hey, I can hear them whispering. All these bad get trained, you can see them glimmering. Had to make a U-turn, I just seen a roll block. I ain't playing no game, I ain't spreading no out. It's full moon now, so I'm burning more rock. Look at no skin, why is he on TikTok? I'm on Lily Court, it's a little court, right? RP Coke, right? RP 24, I can make a cool 50 can, let's 24 out. Grind with the pack through 10 C mounts. Feed me in socks and elite three routers. I'm thumb through it, I don't need no counter. Had to reset for Taylor, been my neck on my John. I got oil, I got hell, I got wax, I got flow. A1 zone for I'm feeling like Rocco Big bitch spinning, took a jet to Morocco I got pretty women showing titties like I'm Flocko I came in a heart, tap, I'm still in the drop though I can make the trot drop whenever I won't drop some I can get my big boy dime, he'll pop some These niggas not real slime, they impossible I know that my heart's on what I'm playing possum I come from a different type of car for them gossip Pussy nigga acting like it's up, we'll drop him She digging the rocks in my ear, I'm a roster Come from out the trenches, getting paid like a pop star I be selling weed by the P like a roster Who was in the car, only me and a chopper I can make they heart stop if I decide to pop up I can make it make
Right. Right. What's going on? How's everybody doing? Make sure you guys come on in, hit that like button. How's everybody doing tonight? Shout out to It's Walk. Shout out to all the moderators in the building tonight. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Shout out to Kelvin Birch, Freight Logistics USA. What's going on? Great polo. Shout out to all the MGM members, moderators. Back at it. What's going on? Ken Who, Nastiel, Kelvin Birch, uh, Brown Goat Logistics, Devontae Smalls, Big Hearn. What up, what up, what up? Andrew Green. How's everybody doing tonight? Hope everybody's doing good. Hope everybody's doing good. Bill Bob, what up? Manny the driver, how's everybody doing? Tonight, I want to talk about employee versus entrepreneur. Just another, just another topic that I feel like needs to be discussed. Um, I think people don't understand the different mindsets, you know, um, I think a lot of people, when they come from uh, from the rat race, they come out of the rat way, race into entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of the stuff that they learned along the way in the rat race, a lot of that stuff you got to kind of unlearn. Um, or people who aspire to become an entrepreneur you know um they have to start conditioning uh their mind uh a little bit differently you know they have to prepare for what's to come um i think a lot of people think it's an easy transition um i i, I started to realize that when i started that call-in show especially with the the younger generation and believe it or not a lot of older people who who you would think would be more mentally seasoned due to uh, their wisdom of just uh, being around for a certain length of time, just having years of experience in life, you know, yet and still I, I see that some some older people are having a hard time uh, differentiating um the two so i want to kind of talk about that tonight it's going to be brief um and then i'm going to let you guys go so come on in shout out to moving company hustle shout out to casey carwell uh manny the driver being my own boss just mean i gave myself a job good thing i'm an excellent employee shout out to casey uh carwell for becoming a member all right, so boom, Paul Smith. So check this out. Check this out. Let me pull up the whiteboard. I want to pull up the whiteboard for this. I want to pull up the whiteboard for this. And we're just going to go through some some key topics. I'm not really even going to do a compare and contrast on, you know, pros and cons of the two. I'm just going to highlight some things that I think are important that people need to understand uh when they're transitioning from or when they're doing their research and they're thinking about getting in i want them to mentally be prepared for what's to come all right so we're going to put uh let's start with employee i'm sorry my circle is not perfect uh well damn i could use the one i already had up the all right, let's put uh let's start with the employee. All right, so and we can do some crowd interactions or some 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 chat interaction too. So what are some key things um that <clears throat> as an employee you get that you may not get as an entrepreneur? So what are some key components as an employee that may benefit you more so from being an employee uh, than an entrepreneur. Um, I'll kick it off. I'll kick it off. Uh, let's change the color. I'll say, uh, I'll kick it off. Set paycheck. All right. Set paycheck. All right. So as an employee, 
you get a set paycheck. You know what you make hourly. You know what you make salary. If you get paid every Friday, as long as you come to work, do what you're supposed to do or do to the best ability of what you're supposed to do, you know every Friday your money is going to be there. Now, on the contrary, it doesn't work like that as an entrepreneur. And, 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 and there's one thing, there's one thing that I really want to get into at the end because I saw something yesterday, it came across my feed, and, and, it, it, and it, it just it did, it didn't set well with me. I don't even know how it came across my feet, but I'm going to get into it because that has a, a, a plays a big point with what I'm, I'm talking about. And I was going to do this today anyway, but that came across. So I'm going to incorporate it. I'm going to incorporate that into my lecture tonight. All right. So, 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 so stay tuned. You might want to stick around. You might want to stick around. So paycheck you get a set paycheck every friday every other wednesday every thursday every wednesday night your money gets direct deposited you can expect it doesn't work like that as an entrepreneur if you don't get out there and go get to it you're not gonna eat all right if you start a business all right it's up to you to source revenue that's going to come into your business all right when you work a job you're getting hired they've already done that leg work for you they're just going to point you in a direction, tell you what to do. You do it. They're going to pay you. You're trading time for money. As an employee, you're, you're trading time. You're trading, you're trading your time for money. You don't have to worry about all the inner workings of how that particular business that you work for is sourcing that revenue to be in, in order to be able to pay you. It's not your concern. You're there to do a job. If you're a police officer and you're on the patrol squad, they're paying you. You're trading your time to patrol the streets. If you work at McDonald's and they say, hey, today you're on the drive through. You're trading your time for revenue, for money. And that particular day, you're going to work the drive through. If you are a Amazon DSP van driver, you work for a DSP and they're paying you $150 for 10 to 14 hours of your, of your time, you're trading 10 to 14 hours of your time for $150. How that DSP sources that revenue to be able to pay you that $150 that you've traded your time in for, that's none of your concern. As long as that money is there, you don't care. As an entrepreneur, it's your job to source the revenue, to make sure the revenue is coming in so that you can continue to pay your employees and not only necessarily pay your employees, but make sure that there's a check for you at the end of it all, because remember, as an entrepreneur, you're always the last person to get paid. All right. All right. Let's see. Let's see what paid days off. We got insurance. OK, so that's a good one. So what we're going to do with paid days off and insurance. So I see Nikki put insurance. Andrew put paid days off. We're going to couple that all together under benefits. We're going to couple all that together under benefits, paid days off. So that'd be PTO, insurance, retirement plan, all the, we're just going to couple that benefits. Now, this is something that I've touched on a few times. All right. As an employee, you get benefits, you get a benefits package. All right. That's an incentive for you to come and work for a company. As an entrepreneur, it's up to you to purchase your own benefits package, all right? And that is supposed to come from the revenue that your business is bringing in. I know a lot of you guys don't do it. How do I know this? Because when I invite you up here on testimonials, when I, you do the call-in show, when we do your numbers, I still have yet for one person to say health insurance, retirement plan, not one, still to this day. All right. So, you know, benefits, it's up to you. So if you're working on an, uh, 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 an, 
whatever your margin is, you still have to factor in your benefits. You want to get your teeth cleaned. Every six months, you want to go to the dentist and get your teeth cleaned. If you got a tummy ache that's been going for three or four days, that's not normal. You need to go to the doctor. But you need to have some benefits. You don't want to stroll into the emergency room and, and when you get to the triage and they pull you in there and they sit you down and ask you what's wrong with you with that clipboard and they see your medical card and you be you ain't got no medical Yeah, they're going to take you, but they also going to send you that bill too. And that bill is going to be a lot more when you have to pay it directly going to the emergency room versus you calling your doctor, your family practitioner, making an appointment Going in, paying a small copay, if you have a copay, seeing your doctor, the insurance is going to get a big discount versus if you were to go see a doctor directly and have to pay, they're getting a discount. And you just pay your copay, you go in there, he tells you, oh, you got the stomach flu or whatever, writes you a prescription, you go to the Walgreens, you got good insurance, you're probably not even going to have to pay for the prescription or they'll write you a script for the generic version. You might have to pay four or five dollars, whatever. But at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, it's your responsibility to source your own benefits package. And you have to pay for it monthly. I pay for health insurance every month. And guess what? It goes up every year. The past few years since the pandemic, it's been going up every year since the pandemic started. I pay so much money for insurance, it's ridiculous. But guess what? That's one of those things that, well, you, you have no choice. You got you to you gotta pay it. Well, I pay it. You know why? Because I like to go to the dentist, and when something's wrong, outside of my six-month checkup, I, I, I get my behind on the phone, and I call, and I make an appointment. You know why? Because I'm paying for it. Damn near $800 a month. So I'm going to utilize it as much as I can because there's out of the, the all the years that I've been an entrepreneur, I got my benefits package in 2011. They've made more money from me since 2011 than I've actually spent, obviously, going to the doctor. I'm not a sickly person. So whenever there's an, I don't care if, if 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 I got a tingle, I'm going to the doctor. Just for him to tell me you tweaking. You tweaking. All right? But it's your responsibility. That's something that you have to pay for. It's no 50% uh company matches you. None of that. All right? So benefits. Uh Benefits from, uh, let's see, what else, what else? Any other thing? Been there, out of pocket, let me see. Uh, insurance, health, health. Okay, let, let me, let me, let me put, put, put something else up there. Set hours, all right? So we got set paycheck, we got benefits. Now we got set hours. This is an actual Plus, if you work as an employee, if your schedule is nine to five, it's nine to five. If it's Monday through Friday, nine to five, it's Monday through Friday, nine to five. As an entrepreneur, you really have no set schedule. You may have a, a, a set schedule, depending on the industry you're in, the type of business you own, to somewhat of a degree. But if something arises and it's your business, it's your institution, it's your problem now. If you own, you know, a restaurant and, you know, um, you're short staffed and it's closing time, the cleanup is going to take a little bit longer. You may not get home, you know, at the normal time. If something arises at the, in the middle of the night where you own, let's say, a brick and mortar business and let's say they do a smash and grab in the middle of the night and the alarm is ringing and the police are calling and ADT is calling you, then at 2, 3 in the morning when they ran a, 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 a Toyota 4Runner that they stole right through the front door, you got to get up and head down there and deal with that issue at 3 in the morning. 
as an employee, you don't have to deal with those issues. If you are a salesperson at Burberry or Gucci or Canada Goose, and that happens there as an employee, you're going to hear about it in the morning when they tell you, you know what, you don't got to come to work today. There was a smash and grab. There's a forerunner sitting in the middle of the, 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 the sales floor. So we're waiting on a uh, uh, Cook County board up to come board up uh, the front windows until uh, we can get a contractor out here to give us an estimate to rebuild uh, the front facade in front of the storefront. That's not your problem. An entrepreneur hours aren't set. You're pretty much working damn near, as long as you're woke, you're working. Even if you're not in your place of business, a great entrepreneur is always thinking about further down the line. They're thinking about how they can make more money. They're thinking about how they can pro progress the business. They're thinking about how they can grow the business. They're thinking about how they can compete. They're thinking about what's moving versus what's not moving. If it's a retail store, they're thinking about maybe moving the men's floor from the second floor to the first floor or moving the women's floor from the second floor to the first floor because they see that the women's floor outperforms the men's floor. So it's best to put the women's floor on the first floor since they're, that's, that's making more money so the women can come right in and then just be on their floor. Whatever the case may be, you're always working. You're always thinking. You don't have to physically be there to be working if you're sitting on a beach drinking a pina colada and you're on your laptop and you're 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 planning you're you're working on a powerpoint for your business you're working you punch out at five o'clock, you ain't thinking about McDonald's. You're not thinking about Apple or Google or Amazon, whatever corporation or company that you work for. Once you punch out, you're not thinking about that until it's time to punch in again. As an entrepreneur, your brain, a good, a good entrepreneur, your brain, you don't necessarily have to be in the physical aspect of something to deem it as work. So an entrepreneur really doesn't have set hours, whereas an employee does. Um, benefits, um, here's one, and this can be debatable, but I'm putting less stress. And that's not to say that employees don't have stress when it comes to their work, you know, especially like corporate people who are trying to move up the corporate ladder, uh, uh, and they're, you know, maybe under competition, you know, or you may have like, uh, let's say women, a woman who is trying to move up the corporate ladder and she's in a male dominated industry and maybe she's stressed out because she understands I mean, she's in a male dominated industry. So that may be stressing her out because she feels like, you know, she's due up for a promotion and she's getting looked over. You know, stuff like that can cause stress or just, you know, the workload within itself, depending on what industry you could be in, in in fast food. And it could be one of those days like what's going on now with a lot of fast food restaurants. The turnover rate is extremely high, like it's always been. But there's a lack of staff. All right. So you could be the one of the two people that actually showed up to work to that particular day. And now, because it's only two of you, you have to close the dining room. You have to put a sign on the front door that says drive through. Uh, we're only opening the drive through is only open. So now you got to come through the drive through and you got 100 cars, but it's only two of you. So now you're doing the job of seven or eight people. So that can cause stress. As an entrepreneur, you're responsible for pretty much every single task. Right. And you may not be physically doing every single task. But just the delegation and, uh, and, 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 and overseeing uh, different positions within your company, as well as dealing with uh, the tasks that you have as the owner, the phone calls, the emails, 
um, customer complaints if you're in a service-based industry, dealing with customers, customer acquisition, customer retention, uh, figuring out new marketing uh, 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 I, new marketing ideas, new promotion ideas, uh, HR duties, dealing with employee conflicts within the company, boosting employee morale. If you're in the trucking industry and you got a fleet of trucks, keeping up with the maintenance of the trucks. Dealing with all the personal issues that the drivers bring to work, having to be a therapist. Brainstorming constantly. You got to be, like, I'm telling you, at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur at scale, when you come home and you finally do get to hit that pillow, you're out of there. I always say it, your, your biggest, one of your biggest challenges, I should say, as being, uh, uh, being an entrepreneur is problem solving. All right. A lot of people want to make money, a lot of money. The more money you make, the more problems you're going to have. Like, that's just not a saying. It's not a famous Biggie song. That's the real deal. And anybody that's out here that's that's started anything and is it as it scaled and it got bigger and they made more money, they saw more issues. Right. You got a bigger footprint. Right. The bigger your footprint, the more opportunity for failure, the more opportunity for problem. When I say failure, not like the business failing, but Things fell in within the business, problems, situations, issues, right? The more money you make, the bigger your footprint is, the more problems. And as a entrepreneur, you have to be a great problem solver. There's no HR. You are HR. There's no upper management. You are upper management. There's no one for you to run to like you would as an employee to complain to. An employee is going to HR. They're going to upper management. If, the resol- if, the, if they can't come with a resolution there uh, within the store, going through the chain of command, depending on the type of company. A lot of you guys that have worked for big companies, when you go in the break room, there's always a poster there. Employee hotline number. There's always a corporate number. If you can't get something rectified with an HR and upper management, corporate has a corporate hotline number that you can call in most large corporate institutions. People aren't coming to you with their stress. It's not your problem. You're just an employee too. For the most part, unless you're like HR or something, you can be met with a level of stress, but not like an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is dealing with every single aspect of that business. The business goes home with them. The business goes on vacation with them. Even at scale, you could have a management team, but guess what? Certain things have to be cleared through you no matter what. There's things that you have left somewhere written down on a piece of paper on a hard drive and said, listen, I don't care what's going on. You can't make a decision on this, 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 and this without clearing it through me first. I don't care if I'm in in heaven. You better find a way to get on the stairway to heaven to come clear it with me. So if you're on vacation, you overseas somewhere and one of those situations arise and it works its way up through upper management, guess what? Man, I hate to do it. Man, Marky Mark over in um, Santorini, Greece. Man, I don't want to call him while he's over there, but man, I got to call him. So now this creates a level of stress because you're on vacation. Boo Bay, like, man, we on vacation. You better not answer that phone. Hey, this the money. It, it, trust me, they know not to call me. So it's got to be serious. I got to pick it up. Before you even answer the phone, You what's shit racing through your head? It's different as an entrepreneur versus an employee. Um, 
let's see if we got some more. What up? What up? What up? What up? Marley Sheen benefits. We got that. Uh, uh, all right, let's flip, let's flip it over to, let's flip it over to, um, let's flip it over to entrepreneur. Let's flip it over to entrepreneur. I think people get the point for employee, but we just wanted to touch on the basics and there's more, but I just wanted to touch on some of the basics. Uh, all right, entrepreneurship. I'm going to kick it off. All right. Here's the main thing a lot of people say why they want to start a business. And that's independence. All right. And entrepreneurship does give you, uh, you know, I want to change the color. It does give you some level of independence. Um, uh, you don't have upper management breathing down your neck to some extent you can come and go as you please you can make decisions and I think ultimately to be honest with you when I when I think about it when I ask people why do you want to be an entrepreneur why you want on your business and this is pretty much the answer they give me they don't say independence they just say oh I, I don't want I can't work for nobody that's the number one answer I can't work for nobody not because you know you know, I would expect something like, well, you know, entrepreneur is going to, you know, it's a it's a possibility that entrepreneurship can provide me a better quality of life. Or I have an idea that I can make a lot more money with this idea um, as a business owner than I could uh working for someone else that's not the answer I, I i i never get that those types of answers i always get man i, I just can't work for nobody man I, I can't work for nobody so independence um i think a lot of people majority of people that want to become an entrepreneur they want the independence they want to come and go as they please i think a lot of people mistake or they have a a, a, a a false perception of what independence is in entrepreneurship, though. I think that they think it's going to be a lot easier than what they're expecting. And this is where a lot of people go wrong. Yes, you can come and go and this, that, and the third as you please. But if you're coming and going and you're, you know, doing what you want when you want, and not really focusing on the business, that's going to determine your success. And that's why a lot of people fail. Because they they take on that role of independence and not having to report to a job on a specific day at a specific time. Not being released from that job at a specific time. If you're supposed to be there at 5, you get that schedule every week, a week prior. And they say, all right, next week you own Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. They have somewhere to be. It's that level of control helps kind of keep them in line. It gives them a purpose. Monday, I have a purpose from nine to five. Tuesday, I got a purpose from, from nine to five. Wednesday, I got a purpose from nine to five. You want the independence. A lot of people want that independence, but they never had that independence before. And when they get that independence, they don't know what to do with it. They don't have the self-discipline to buckle down and put themselves on the schedule. They don't have the, 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 the work ethic that after they've been working on this business for eight hours and the job really isn't done, they just say, all right, man, whatever. I, I just figure that out. Or if they got a, a a company that started a company and they're getting a flurry of calls and it's a startup company, instead of taking all those calls and working and working and working to the wee hours of the night, getting all that money because you need all that money, your startup business, you're trying to recoup your initial investment into the business. And you're also trying to uh, uh build a customer base. So turning away customers 
wouldn't be a a, a, a great idea. You want to put yourself in front of new customers so that you can build retention. They say, man, I'm, I'm done for the day. Man, I made my two, three hundred. I'm done. Man, it's five more people want me to come and, and, and cut their grass. Man, I, I'm, it's, I'm done. It's a wrap. Man, it's a wrap. So you get that level of independence. And you don't have the self-control, the discipline, or the work ethic to really even understand how to benefit from it. Your job might say nine to five, and that five, we not, you might want OT. They be like, we ain't doing OT. You might have had three lawns to cut that day, but within that day, you got five calls for same day service. And you turned them away because you made plans with Boo Bay. You wanted OT when you was employee, but now you can get all the OT you want as long as the customers are calling. But you ain't willing to do it. Why? Because you ain't got nobody leaning on you, telling you when you can eat, shit, go to lunch, be here, leave. Another thing. A pro. Unlimited. Earning. Potential. All right. It kind of coincides with what we just talking about. It's kind of goes into that unlimited earning potential. Nine to five. Nine to five. No OT. No OT. If the phone keeps ringing, you can keep making money. You can search for money. It don't have to stop. If you're in a box truck or in a, let's say a cargo van, if you, you've done your route at Waco or, or, or T4s and it's 2 o'clock, man, listen, it's 2 o'clock. You already downloaded GoShare. You already downloaded Curry. You got uh, uh, Roadie, Freight, Mothership, whatever. GoShare. Thumbtack. It's two o'clock. What you finna do? You still got sunlight. You still got daylight. It's still money out here. You gonna go home with that little 300? Or you finna hit these apps and keep keep it keep it keep it moving, keep working. Sky's the limit. You cut it off when you want to cut it off in some aspects. If you are, obviously, if you are OTR, over-the-road trucker, you, you may not have this luxury. But any other aspect, you can kind of cut it off when, when you want to cut it off. I told a story yesterday about a lady that called because her movers didn't show up way back when I was first getting started. She was desperate. She was crying. It was late at night. She wasn't going to find a moving company to come move her. She had to be out by midnight. She paid a premium. I was damn near on my way to bed, but I'm not turning. I can't remember what it was, but back then, it had to be like 2012, maybe 2013. It had to be at that time. I think I might have charged her three, four $400 an hour. Because I remember telling the guys that came with me, I paid them $100 an hour. So it had to be at least $300 an hour. And this is back then. And she paid it. I got redressed, drove back to the yard, met them there, drove on the other side of town, and started a move at 9, 10 o'clock at night. Why? Because the money was on the table. I don't leave money on the table. If you trying to, listen, you can get to a point where you can turn stuff away. I've turned stuff away if it didn't make sense, right? When you get to a certain level, you can turn things away that may not make sense for you at that particular point you're at in your career or in your life. But when you're on the new and you're getting started, 
and someone's trying to give you their money at a premium, you a fool if you're going to go take it. Unlimited earning potential. When you on, listen, your job, if you work a 40 hours a week, they not going to call you most likely after you got off at five. They not going to call you back at nine o'clock at night and say, hey, somebody from the third shift didn't come in. We know you got to be back here at nine and we know you going to hit over 40 hours, but we need you to come back in. We need you to be here in an hour. All right. So be here at 10. We're going to have you work from 10 to six. We're going to let you sleep in the break room from 6 to 7, and then we need you back on the clock at 8 for your, your, your shift. You know that's against the law. They're not going to call you and ask you that. And even if they did, they're not going to pay you a premium. You're not going to be able to name your price. Listen, when that lady called, I... Name my price. Listen, if you want us to come do this this late at night, this last minute, when I'm already at the crib, chilling damn near, finna go to bed, man, this is what you're gonna have to pay. What's up? What you wanna do? You name a price to the point where you expect them to say no, because you really, you really don't want to do it because you, you but if they pay it, we gone. That's one of them prices where you 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 throw it out there because you 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 throw a price out there because you you do it but you really don't want to do it so you throw a price out there that you think they're gonna say no to but if they say yeah then we gone. She said yeah we gone. You you can't do that with a with a job. If your salary is $100,000 a year and you may get some overtime here and there, you can't say, all right, well, I'm going to go in to Amazon as a DSP driver this year. As a DSP driver, I'm going to make $180,000. No, you're not. You're going to make $150 a day times however many days you work that year. You can't create a, a, a strategy or a plan on how you're going to maximize your earning potential as an employee of an employee. They're, they're, they're a middle manager for Amazon. You can't create a, 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 a strategy for that. But as an entrepreneur, you can't listen. This is what we're going to do. All right, we made half a million this year. I want to increase that by 25%. I want to go up to 750 this year. And what we're going to do by, to go up to that, to make that extra 250,000, we close on Sundays. We're going to start running seven days a week. We're going to, we're going to open seven days a week. All right, uh, uh, for, the, for, for 2025. Um, also, what we're going to do, we're going to increase our, our, our rates by 10%. All right, we're no longer going to give free shrink wrap. We're no longer going to give free wardrobe boxes. All right, all right, COVID's here now and people are germophobic. So whatever wardrobe boxes we put people's clothes in, it's theirs now. So we're going to charge them for wardrobe boxes. We're not recycling and putting this customer's clothes in this wardrobe and, and using this for marketing and say free wardrobes. And then we get there, we take their clothes out and put them in the closet. And we fold these wardrobe boxes out and we use them. No, we're going to charge them for the wardrobe. So that should increase revenue by 3%. You can create a plan as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur to increase your revenue. You can't do that as an employee. If, you're, if, you're, if your salary increases 2% a year, then 2%. And pray that they give you some overtime. And if it's a, an industry where you could potentially get a bonus, pray that you perform to to uh, uh, the degree that you need to in order for you to be able to get a bonus. But there's no strategy you can put together like an entrepreneur to say, you know, I want to make a million this year. Here's the plan. Here's the roadmap for me to get to a million dollars in revenue.
So unlimited earning potential, all right? You can make as much money as you want. Well, Mark, man, it's bad out here in the box truck business. No, it's not. Who told you that? We had that debate yesterday. It's always money. You look at something bad, it's bad. I look at it as an opportunity. It all starts up here. All right, what's next? Uh, pursue your dreams. Sometimes in, as, an, as an employee, you can kind of get lost in a rat race, right? Not everybody's an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship gives you the ability to be able to chase your dreams. If you, let's say, grew up in the South or your mother's from the South or your granny's from the South and she makes a great sweet potato pie, like the best. Everybody that eats her sweet potato pie, they love granny's sweet potato pie. And you already know what I said about grannies. You know what I said about granny. Some of y'all don't understand. If your granny ain't got that arm, listen, let me explain something to you. Your granny got to have one of them auntie granny arms where her skin is sagging. That's how you know you got a granny that can cook. If she ain't got the saggy arm, then I don't know. But if your granny got a saggy arm and she got a hell of a sweet potato pie, everybody that eats granny sweet potato pie falls in love with it. And, you know, people travel from far and near. They call her. They offer granny, granny, please make me one of sweet potato pies. Man, I'll cash up you 200. I'll cash up you 200, granny. I'm going to be in town. Make me one of the sweet potato pies. So I could, matter of fact, make me five of them. Because I want to eat one and I want to take four back with me. And you want to take that recipe, right, and pursue that passion, something that your granny had that recipe and kind of, you know, build that for your family to kind of keep granny's name alive. That's a dream of yours. You can pursue it. Right. And now you have some type of motivation, you know, uh, uh, behind you and you can work towards making that thing successful. People with an employee mindset, you know, they may have, they may come across, different ideas. I talk to a lot of people all the time that work jobs, but they don't have a desire to be an entrepreneur, but they do have great ideas, but they'll never put forth the effort of putting those ideas and bringing them into fruition because they don't want to deal with what comes with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship gives you an opportunity to pursue your dreams, all right? Getting caught in the rat race doesn't. One thing about the rat race is they want to purposely take up most of your time. And when they're taking up that time, they pretty much want to drain you so that when you go home, only thing you have time to do or, or, or the energy to do is take a shower or a bath Get something to eat and go to sleep. Because in the eight hours, you got to get right back up. Even to a person who does want to pursue their dream, listen to a lot of the people that we talk to that, that want to start a box truck business. Some of them can't leave, right? Some of them too scared to leave. Because the rat race the the corporate world that's why they call it a trap and now check this out it ain't nothing wrong with it either it ain't nothing wrong with it but you know entrepreneur entrepreneurship it 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 has provided me and moving and finding my delivery it wasn't a dream of mine it was something i fell into that was a back against the wall situation i've told the story i just posted an ad one day because i seen someone else that had to add up and I actually, I had a pickup truck too and I didn't have any bread at the time. I was in between jobs and I didn't expect to get, I put the ad up and I just got a call and continued to get calls and never looked back. But those weren't dreams, but with the moving and what the final mile did do for me, it gave me, it gave me the launching pad to 
provide me with the capital to invest into other creative ideas that I did have and that I did come up with and that I continue to come up with, right? So that's one thing about entrepreneurship. I, I think that's a fun thing. All right, so let's get back to uh, uh, the business at hand. I wanted to add something fun in there. All right, diversify. Diversify income. All right, boom. Mark, what do you mean about di diversifying income? If the, the, the business is my income, right? But it's like I always say, it's just like what the moving and the final amount did for me. It gave me an opportunity to springboard me into other things, other investments, right? So diversify income. This is something that we talk about too. I feel like I need to branch this out. So diversify income. Uh, let's say you could do stocks. Uh, uh, 401k. Uh, you can go down to real estate. Uh, you can do crypto. You can do, uh, 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 what else? What else? What else? What else? Uh, you can create uh 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 other let's say other businesses excuse my handwriting so there's a few list of different things that whatever your main active income business is if it's box trucking if it's semi trucking if it's a cargo van business if you have a successful restaurant if you have a successful daycare that business and the revenue from that business, especially when it becomes successful and you have money to take to invest it into other things to create other sources and other streams of income and other streams of revenue, it gives you the opportunity. A lot of the times when people work careers, you know, they have, not everybody, some people, you know, are living check to check. But that's just the way, th I mean, that shit has always been the way. Most, and the middle class really don't exist anymore, but let's just say middle class for time constraints. Live check to check, all right? People who do save, right, you know, that type of income they coming in, that's coming in from their, from their career, their job, after they pay, you know, their mortgage or their rent, their car notes, their utilities, if they have a family with kids, you know, they pay their kids. They may have a few coins to save up and they saving that towards the kids college tuition, the kids tuition currently if they're going to private schools, uh, their kids are growing. So they constantly have to buy clothes. You know, they got to plan for a family vacation over the, the summer. You have to have a pot for incidentals. The water boiler might go out. The furnace might go out. Um, you might have a plumbing issue. You know, they may have to come and dig up the whole front yard to get to the sewage to rot. They might have to rot the damn sewer or something. And that shit could cost a lot of money. Whatever the situation may be. You know, so with entrepreneurship, especially as a successful entrepreneur, you have the potential to make a whole lot more than you would if you want a job. You know, there's people that have the aspirations to make $100,000 a year on a job. I remember in 2014, I had months where I was making $100,000 a month. All right? So with that type of revenue coming in, right, it will award you or allot you the type of money to be able to invest into other things. You can start another business, right? You can invest into real estate. You can build a portfolio of stocks and crypto for your business. A lot of people that work, you know, careers and jobs, a lot of the times they may not have that extra money to invest into other things. And when they do have it, they may do do it. But then if something arises, like an unforeseen situation, 
they have to dip into it. How many times have you heard of people dipping into their 401k? We've had people that during the pandemic went into their 401k under the assumption because they listened to these content creators. You know, these content creators that was out during the pandemic, some of them still floating around here, that was selling them this dream and they really believed in this. They really believed in it. And, 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 and that's fine because it's, it's, it's definitely attainable. You definitely can build a successful trucking business, but the, the people that they were listening to were misleading them and giving them misinformation because they were misinformed themselves and they were uneducated and they were rookies themselves. They should have been telling nobody on how to do nothing. You see what I'm saying? But you have people that dipped into their 401k during the pandemic and lost. So they got to pay a penalty. You have people that have come up and admitted that they reached into little man man's college tuition, took all little man man college tuition and went out and bought a box truck and started a box truck business and failed. These are working, everyday working people that at one point were making enough money or they were living within their means which gave them the ability to be able to take 2%, 3%, 5%, 10%, whatever it was, and invest it. Obviously, that their career is putting that money in that 401k for them, but that money she put into little man man, that, that lady that put that little money into man man, she took that 30000 out to start that box truck business. That was money that she was saving. That was money that she was delaying her personal gratification for the betterment of her child for the future. And that's a sacrifice. As an entrepreneur, that $30,000, that extra 30000 that might be your profit for a week or two. Depending on what industry you're in, what you're doing, and at what point of scale you at, at thirty thousand, you like shit. Uh, thirty thousand, we make that next week. So entrepreneurship gives you the ability to diversify your income. All right, and I talk about it all the time when people come up here and say, man, I want to get a box truck business so I can start, uh, create generational wealth. A box truck business by itself is not going to give you generational wealth. Hit the like button. It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. Starting a box truck business here, this is your box truck business here, Starting your box truck business here, building that business to be successful, then diversifying your income here from that box truck business and creating other businesses, investing into real estate, investing into stocks, investing into 401ks, investing into crypto, this diversifying that active income from that business into other streams is what's going to get you generational wealth. Just the box truck business by itself. Just off the top of anybody's head, can anybody name me in the past 20 years, 25 years, a trucking business that you know that was started, that was built a thousand plus trucks. That's a family owned business. And I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, 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 it hasn't happened. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm, I just want to, I want to see something. Anybody know a trucking business that was started within the past 20, 25 years that has grown to a thousand plus trucks. Anybody. And it could be a pop. It don't have to be nobody you know. It could be a, a big 
company. It could be a big company. A big company that's well known. But within the past 25 years, I'm trying to prove a point here. And I know it's a delay, so I'll give it a few more seconds. It's about a 10-second delay from when I'm saying it versus when y'all hearing it. Biz said most are older. Exactly. Exactly. Fluid truck, that's 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 a rental truck company. I'm talking about like a, a traditional trucking company, like your Schneiders, your JB Hunts, things like that. I'll give you one. The youngest, most successful trucking company that I can think of is XPO. That's probably the last conglomerate trucking company that was built. Which, what they've done is... They're number three now. They're number three now. Somebody said C.H. Robinson. <laughs> Somebody said C.H. Robinson. Let's see something here. Let's see something here. Uh, give me one second. XPO found it 2000. So 24 years. Now, XPO, I was right. I just wanted to double check, you know, because I don't want to give misinformation, but I, I knew the answer. XPO is the last conglomerate trucking company, 20, 24 years old, all right? The way XPO, what XPO accomplished, this is what they set out to accomplish. Where you see XPO at now, this is what they set out to do from the inception. But see, the, to the people that I talk to ain't coming in with partners and venture capitalists and angel investors and shit like that. XPO is where they're at because where they're at is what they came to do when they came in in 2000. This is what they came to do. So it's not to say that it can't be done again. But to the majority of people, the majority of people can't do it. That's the point. That's why I say building generational wealth from a trucking company is not likely. Take it how you want it. Because I know there's other people out there telling you, oh, come in and get generational wealth. Hit the link below and tap in. And I'm going to show you how to do it. How can somebody show you how to build generational wealth in a trucking company and they ain't did it? If somebody's telling you they're going to show you how to build generational wealth in a trucking company that hasn't built generational wealth in a trucking company. Why do you hit the link? I haven't built generational wealth in a trucking company. I had to invest into other things. Why? The margins. The lack of resources. 
It's different when you're coming into a business with billions of dollars. You can come in, you're already coming in with money. So guess what? I got money. I can go buy more resources. I have resources, but I got the money to buy more resources. Majority of the people that I speak to look like me. Majority of the people that I speak to look like me. They come from similar backgrounds. Not everybody. Some of y'all middle Americans, man. Some of y'all little, some of y'all be watching. Y'all, some of y'all entitled. No cap. Some of y'all middle Americans, some of y'all entitled. Not everybody had to get it out the mud. I'm just saying. I'm just saying now. But even the entitled ones. To gather those types of resources. To get those VCs on board. Those angel investors for a trucking company in 2024. How are you going to re-engineer trucking? What plan are you going to give to us? For us to want to be able to invest into you billions of dollars with the hopes that we can take this company public in the next 10 years. What are you going to do in trucking that ain't already been done? That's why the last conglomerate is XPO. And the basic part, you said what I just said. They came in with resources. And because they came in with a large amount of resources, they were able to purchase more resources. I fell victim to XPO at one point in 2015. I told a story already. We were making a shit ton of money with Dynamics. We were running Office Depot, Ikea. They lost Ikea to Urban Express, a private company. Back, back when I started, the way, the way Final Mile is now with all these big trucking companies acquiring these companies wasn't like that. 3PL companies were all private back in the day. They were all private. When we went over to Urban Express, we was only with Urban Express, what, five or six months, and then XPO bought them. Then we had to fold under XPO until I said, you know what? I'm not getting a $3 million umbrella. When they brought me that $3 million umbrella, I said, no. My broker said, man, is this worth it? I said, man, your insurance is, this is, is it worth it? XPO had the resources to acquire more resources. They came through and they were like 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. They was buying everybody. I witnessed it. See, that's the difference between me and a lot of these other guys outside of Kurt. We've been around. I witnessed XPO going to go on a shopping spree. They bought up every single small private company that wasn't nailed down. They had the resources. They took the company public. The company that we were running for that they bought out was called Urban Express. It's called Urban Express. We were doing, after we lost Ikea, well, we didn't lose Ikea. Dynamics, which is now T-Force, they lost Ikea. Uh, Urban Express picked it up. Then we went over to Urban Express. We had to go apply with them. We applied with them. We went on. And then, shit, after five or six months running with Urban Express, they were acquired by XPO. So then we was running for XPO. And then once XBO fully, you know, transitioned in and, you know, implemented their policies, that's when I got out of XPO because they required a $3 million umbrella on top of the million dollar general liability 
that we already had running that account for Urban Express and it just became too expensive for the insurance. So we ended up walking away from that contract. But XPO went on a shopping spree back then. Right. So you saw other companies mimic it then because obviously they were doing R&D. Right. So as these companies did R&D and they saw XPO purchasing all these small 3PL final mile companies, all these other companies started doing CRST, bought NAL. NAL had already bought installs because I had a contract with installs and then they got acquired by NAL and then CRST acquired them. Marsk acquired Pilot. And the list goes on. And the list goes on. AIT just acquired Select. So when I say it's not likely, I'm not saying it can't be done, but the probability of doing something that an XPO, something of like that of an XPO or Schneider, now these OG companies, they you gotta understand they're early adopters. They, they are they early adopters. Schneiders, your JB Hunts, these guys been around. That's just like trying to come in the door and duplicate Walmart. Man, they gone already. But the way you do it is you start a successful business, you build a successful business, and then you take revenue from that successful business and you create other successful businesses. Now you have a portfolio, an asset portfolio, or a holding company with an asset portfolio of businesses that are all bringing in revenue. Brian Webb, did you ever think about building? You, you got to understand. I, I maxed out at 15 trucks. And to me, that was a lot. All right. It goes back to resources. The resources for me to do something like what they did, I, I didn't have those resources. And this is this this is this is what I'm trying to tell you. It's different levels of success. XPO came in. Where XPO is at now? Listen. You finish how you start. Where XPO is now? This is what they set out to do. When I started, I didn't set out to be where XPO is at. I got in with a back against the wall situation. I'm blessed enough to do what I did. My goal and my plan was to never build a, a, a logistics company to go public. That wasn't my plan. My plan, I didn't start out with a plan to take a company public. I didn't build it. I didn't structure it that way. So the answer, the answer is no. The answer is no. That's why I'm telling people that listen to me. See, you have to speak to your audience. The point that I'm trying to make is The probability of being the next XPO is very minimal. But that doesn't mean that you can't be as successful, right? It doesn't mean that you can't
bring in, the, let's say, the type of revenue that XPO is bringing out. Like XPO bringing in billions of dollars now. But for generational wealth from one business, right, because the founders of that business, they have the most shares in that business. And then when they pass, they're going to pass that down from generation to generation to generation. That's generational wealth. They have billions of dollars in shares in that company. So to do that in a trucking company, you would have to build a trucking company similar to an XPO. Similar to a J.B. Hunt. Similar to a Schneider. Similar to a Swift. Similar to a Prime. But you may not have the resources to get to that point. So you might build a successful trucking company that got five trucks. You may be doing a million dollars a year. You may be operating on a 20% margin. That's enough for you to invest into other things. That's enough for you to take out a business line of credit, leverage it, get property, Borrow against the property. Take that income, take that money. Invest it into other things. And then just keep repeating the process. Now you got another business. You go out, you buy the building. Let's say it's a, I don't know, a, a, whatever, a, some type of brick and mortar business. You build that business up. You own a build. You own a building. Now you can leverage that bi- that 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 asset with the capital that you got coming in. Go start you another business. Whole time you investing into stocks. You got some real estate on the side. Some two, three unit buildings, four unit buildings. And you're building what's called an asset portfolio. So now you took this million dollar a year box truck business and you've created and diversified your income. Now you have four or five other streams of revenue. So now you took this million dollar business and you've turned your whole asset portfolio into a $15 million a year business. Because one of these might pop bigger than than the active uh, business that you started initially to be able to give you the income to invest into other businesses. You could invest into a, a restaurant uh, and built a restaurant that just caught fire. You could have built into or bought into or or built a, um, let's just say, I don't know, I'm just making up scenarios. Let's say we have some type of housing market correction. You're able to acquire uh, a lot of pieces of property because you have cash on here from your active income business and you just bought, bought four or five properties on short sales and you sectionate them out. Now you got streams of revenue coming in. You bought the buildings for cheap, right? Uh, this, this business may be bringing you in, bringing you more revenue than this business. Let's say you might've started a successful, I don't know. Just, I don't, I don't know a sneaker selling business. You might start a successful restaurant. You might start a successful um, tech business. You might build an app. You might come up with a crazy idea one day to build an app uh, for something and that app may get bought. Somebody may come and say, you know what? We want to buy that app for $20 million, whatever. I don't know. The point that I'm trying to make is once you diversify, you start here with the million dollar a year business, you diversify into other things, and this is how you grow your asset portfolio. This is how you create generational wealth. Right. You got stocks that are long term plays. You got stocks that are short term plays. You can invest into Rivian now at nine dollars a share. And then one day it could get to where Tesla got to at the peak before the split at what? Two thousand a thousand and something a share. I think it was two thousand a share. You can invest into a company like NVIDIA very, very early in 10, 15 years and hold it. And then it can be couple thousand dollars a share you can invest in the voo the s&p 
and hold it. You got short-term plays, you got long-term plays. Now those long-term plays have accumulated and grown, and then now you're passing that wealth down to the next generation, along with all the real estate, along with all the other assets, the all, all the other business that you have attained and grew over the years. You may not even be in the original business that started it all. I'm not in the original business that started it all for me. But I'm doing better. This is how you build generational wealth. This is the way that I know how to do it. Because I understand the circumstances. Most of these people that you see online, outside of guys like Grant Cardone, outside of guys like that, that tell you about generational wealth, they ain't built generational wealth. If they die today, they kids... Kids, 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 kids ain't straight. And that's not generational wealth. It's not. A lot of these people, I ain't never even heard them talk about health insurance. They tell you to tap in, though. They give you numbers and shit that don't make sense. They give you margins that's... They tell you you can make 70, you're going to make 70% profit margin. They tell you you're going to make 70% profit margin and how to build generational wealth in a box truck, 70%. Come on, man. Come on, man. All right, what's next? I said building assets and wealth, so I'm going to put building assets and wealth. I'm going to leave that under diversify income. Actually, that was my next one. I kind of just went into a rant into it, so I'm going to still put it up here, uh, but I just kind of went into that rant already. Building assets well all right um and here's probably one of the most important if not the most important i know y'all can't read that personal growth and learning all right when you're building a business as you build a business you're growing you're learning all right I think a big key to, I would say, let's say this YouTube channel, for instance, as far as I would, I would deem the success around it and how it continues to grow and how it has grown, uh, accelerated beyond the average growth at the, you know, the average rate growth of a YouTube channel, how mine has accelerated way past uh, the expectations of what an average YouTube channel grows at, even in a small niche um, like this, um, I credit credit it all to the experience, right? All to the experience, right? And I would I would say the next person would be Kurt, right? Obviously, we are the most tenured people in um, this box truck space community. We have the most experience. And I think this is why people get 
so much value from us, all right? Out of all the years, right, and s just sucking up all the information that I've acquired over the years of learning, just building a business, learning from building and just being, you know, there uh, the day-to-day -day is what has me here right now talking to you guys and you guys are taking this information and you guys are going out there applying it and I don't have people coming back at me like you see them coming back at other people, right? You don't see people going, well, man, Mark, man, told me this and this shit didn't work. But you see people coming from other places coming over here. Well, you know, I bought this and, man, you know, it didn't work. Then I found your channel. You see what I'm saying? All that came from experience, right? And because of all that experience that I, I got from building a moving company and building a final mile trucking company and, and trust me, with, with that learning came mistakes, right? But you learn from your mistakes, right? All right. That allowed me to go into other avenues of business, right? Um, and outside of the success, outside of the money, the biggest asset that I feel like I acquired or anybody could acquire from building a business is the education, the information that you get from doing it, all right? Um, it's like I always say, if you understand business, you can build any business and be successful for the most part. If you understand business, you can pretty much build any business and be successful for the most part. So the personal growth, the learning, the education that I got um, from being an entrepreneur, you really don't get that as an employee, right? As an employee, you're tasked with a specific job title. Now they'll train you at whatever that, you know, job title is if you are If you go to a retail store and they hire you on as a sales rep, they're going to train you how to, to sell. Now, they may not, they're not going to train you how to do stock. They may not, they're not going to train you how to do HR. They're not going to train you how to be a GM. They're not going to train you how to be the operations manager. They're going to train you how to sell. And then after you become a good salesman, then they may trust you and put you on the register. They may train you on the register, but they're going to train you to whatever specific job title that they hired you for that they tasking you do on a day to day basis. The beautiful thing about entrepreneurship, you get to learn every aspect of the business. From the top all the way down to the bottom, operations, human resources. The, from the president, the marketing, the operations. And you know, when you start the business from the initial start, all the legwork, all the groundwork, you understand every aspect of that business. You go work for some of these corporations, you're not going to understand every single aspect of the business. Now, you may learn certain aspects of the business as you scale that corporate ladder. And how much of that particular corporation, that particular business you learn all depends on how high you scale. But as an entrepreneur, you're, the, the learning and the personal growth far exceeds it when you're working for a corporation. Now, don't none of this stuff, don't none of this success come without hard work. Now, this is something that I've been preaching a lot, right? A lot, a lot, a whole lot. And the reason why I started preaching is because I started realizing that a lot of people when they come up on the platform on these calling shows, they think this shit is easy. Why? Because they say, I don't want to work for nobody. I want <clears throat> to get a stream of revenue so I can go out and just live life. I'm going to put some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give me a truck. I'm going to rent me a truck and then I'm going to put a driver in it. Well, what you going to do? Man, I'm going to run my business. What you going to do? I'm going to run my business. 
how you gonna run your business man i'm just gonna you know be on my laptop at the crib i'm gonna run my business right why do they why do they think this because they they they're being sold a dream that hard work is foolish and for the life of me i'm like man why are all these people think that i know they've been sell, sold this narrative and then the narrative hits me in the face i'm scrolling minding my business on youtube and a short pops up from a box truck content creator that's pretty much spitting in the face of the average nine to five worker it was appalling to me it was appalling to me no matter how you look at it, if you look at it from the nine to five person, which he mentioned, or you look at it from the entrepreneur standpoint, it was ignorant. There is no successful person that didn't get successful without hard work. Entrepreneurship especially. Now, if you don't want to do the work, then you can start like old XBO and come in with a bunch of money from VCs and angel investors and purchase your resources. What do you mean by purchase your resources? You can come in with the resources to be able to purchase resources, which means pay people who are smarter than you to do the shit that you don't know how to do. But see, the, the thing is, is I understand my audience. And I understand that the majority of people can't do that. See, you can't sell a narrative to the majority of people. You can't sell a one percenter minority. You can't, hold on, how do I want to say it? You can't sell a narrative of a one percenter to the majority. The majority of people Ain't, ain't the 1%. That's why they're the 99%. They're the majority. You can't sell that narrative of a 1% business or a 1% family or a 1% person to the majority. You just can't do it. It's highly unlikely. You have to have resources. If you want to start a business and you don't want to do shit, you think you want to come in not work, have it made in the shape, then you have to be able to pay somebody, which you means you gotta have the resources, you gotta have the capital to pay somebody to do that for you. But now I see where people get it from. I see where people get it from. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to listen to this. I'm not gonna play the video, I just want you to hear it. Can y'all hear that? Can y'all hear that? Can y'all hear this? They're working every single day. Some even got a part-time job. No, hold on. Forget, man. We're just going to thug it out. We're just going to play it. We, we gangsters, man. We gangsters, man. We just going to play it. Hold on a second. I want y'all listening. Let me know what you think. So what is it about hard work? That doesn't seem to be working for a lot of people these days. A lot of people have nine to fives. They're working every single day. Some even got a part-time job. So think about this for a second, guys. Think about this for a second. Most people go get another one of what wasn't working in the first place. Think about that. The average person goes and gets a second job because the first one wasn't really cutting it. So we go add another one of what wasn't working in the first place. Mm, that touched somebody just now. So basically, if you got a job and it's not working for you, you go get another job. Why would you go get a second job if the first one wasn't working for you? So Here's how here's how I look at it. I think it's ignorant, right? And I I expect a lot more from him because he's older. And this is why I be I be kind of poking at him. I don't go at him like you see other people go at him. I I go at him to challenge him to do better. You know, I keep it on the content. You know, first of all, if a person has a job, because I think that's a slap in the face of the average nine to five worker, right? If a person has a job, that doesn't mean if they go get a second job 
the first job is not working. That just means it's not enough. Just because a person goes out and gets a second job does not mean the first job is not working. It's just not enough. We've probably had parents that have had to work two jobs to make sure that we had food uh, on the table, clothes on our back and the roof over our head. It, it, it wasn't the fact that it wasn't working. It just wasn't enough. So when I saw that, which I don't know why they show it, because I don't subscribe. I, the first year I didn't subscribe to everybody. Why? Because I don't want to see the shit. Because when I see shit like that, it upsets me because it misleads people. It gives them the wrong impression of what entrepreneurship is. That shit to me, when I saw that, that shit made my blood boil. Just because a person goes out and gets a second job doesn't mean the first job isn't working. It just means it may not be enough. So now to someone who watches that, who's out working two jobs, just to keep the lights on, just to put food on the table, they might go out to get a second job just so they can keep little man man in private school. It's not that it's not working. It just may not be enough. Hard work. So what? Work smart, not hard? Here's the thing. Working smart is working hard. Working smart is working hard. When you start a business and you come into a business, I, how can you build a business from nothing without hard work? How, can somebody substantiate how to build a business without hard work? Can I? Like, I don't even know how to even come because the shit don't even make sense to me. I would never say no shit like that. There's nothing wrong with working a nine to five. There's nothing wrong with getting a second job if you have to. Listen, if if everything fails, if I lose everything tomorrow, nigga, I will go shovel shit out of your alley to do what I need to do to put me back in the position to get that income because I know how to run it back up. See, the difference is once you get out there and do the work and you build a business and you amass knowledge over the years of running the business and you take that knowledge and you invest into other things so that you can amass more money, you don't you lose that fear of of the risk. That 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 fear that a lot of people get of risking starting a new business shit. Like I lost that shit a long time ago. You know why? Because I know I got this shit up here that I can get it back. Nigga, I'll go shovel shit to get that money up so that I can put it back into the shit that I need to put it back into to run it back up. I'll go work the first job, the second job, and the third job. When I was in college, I went to college full-time, worked a full-time job, and promoted at night. I passed out flyers at night. I didn't have to pay bills. I was living at the crib, but I was hungry. My full-time job working in retail was enough. It was enough to do what I needed it to do. But I wanted more. How is a job? What is this shit? know who it touched but it touched somebody so what is it about hard work that doesn't seem to be working for a lot of people these days how's hard work not working for a lot of people it's a lot of people in here that work hard a lot of people have nine to fives they're working every single day some even got a part-time job 
So think about this for a second, guys. Think about this for a second. Most people go get another one of what wasn't working in the first place. Think about that. The average person goes and gets a second job because the first one wasn't really cutting it. So we go add another one of what wasn't working in the first place. Mm, that touched somebody just now. I don't know who it touched, but it touched somebody. So what is it? About? I disagree with that. I disagree with that, man. Just because a person goes out and gets a second job doesn't mean it wasn't working. It just may not have been enough. If you have to go out and get a second job to do what it, whatever it is that you need to do, put clothes on your kid's back, put food on the table, keep a roof over your head, don't think it, don't think of it like that. Don't think of what your primary income is, is 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 not working it's just not enough if you have the wherewithal if you have the uh, tenacity if you have the motivation the drive right to go out and get a second job i commend you if you work a full-time job and then you go work a second part-time job just to make ends meet i commend you I salute you because you doing what you got to do as a woman. You doing what you got to do as a man. You doing what you got to do as a father. You doing what you got to do as a mother. You doing what you got to do to make sure you have somewhat of, of some type of level of comfortability of life. In order to work smart, you first got to work hard. I say I'll never build a business to the scale of my peak in trucking. So dealing with all those people and shit like that. Why? I've been there. I've done that. I'm on a different mental level. I know how to make money without dealing with people now. At that point, I didn't know how to make money without dealing with people. Now I do. So I don't want to deal with people. I know how to outsource. I understand Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. But then it goes back to the conversation we had moments ago with XPO. If I want to start a box truck business and I don't want to work, that means I have to have the resources to be able to hire someone who has the information, the knowledge, and the know-how to build a business for me. And majority of the people that come into this industry don't have that. They don't have it, man. They think buying a course or a mentorship for X amount of thousands of dollars is going to get them that. But the people that they be buying this shit from, ain't, they ain't even got half a decade in the, ain't in, in the industry. I would never tell nobody, man, <laughs> hey, man, hey, hey, hard work ain't it. Nah, you see me tell people, man, you got to work hard. Here's the thing. You start a box truck business, you want to go OTR. You coming from a, a job, so you still got that employee mindset, right? Man, over here on this entrepreneur shot, it's competitive. See, you ain't competing at your job. You might be competing to go up the, the corporate ranks, but you might be comfortable where you at. You're not looking for a promotion. Or even if you is looking for a promotion, you might be competing with one or two other people. Man, it's dogs over here. It's, it's, it's way more money over here. It's way more money. It's some dogs over here that's willing to work. They're willing to outwork you. They're willing to outwork you. So how you ain't going to work? Tell me how you going to start this trucking business, this OTR trucking business without work. Tell me how you going to work smarter than harder starting the OTR trucking business. Can somebody tell me that? 
Somebody in the, in the chat, substantiate that for me. How can you start a OTR trucking business not working smarter and harder, not, you know, not working together smart, cohesively, working smarter and harder cohesively? Somebody tell me just how to do it smarter without working hard. I'll wait. How can you start a moving company smart and don't add the hard in it? How can you start a uh, 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 a final mile company smart without the hard in it? How can you start a a a, a, a cargo van company smart? Listen, everybody that I know is successful. That wasn't entitled. See, and this is what I'm saying. Listen, this conversation is for the non-entitled people. Everybody that I know that's successful, that 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 is not entitled, all had to work hard. We can talk from business, we can talk from sports. What does Mayweather chant? Hard work, dedication. Did Mayweather achieve what he achieved in his illustrious career without hard work? We watched this dude on one of them all access. This man went to Fat Burger, ate like a goddamn pig, and then ran for miles with a security riding down the side of the road with him. You see this man training in the gym. That's years of hard work. Michael Jordan, years of hard work. LeBron James, as old as he is still, hard work. Look at all the hard work LeBron James. And I know him in the sports, but I just wanted to do a segue into something else outside of business, just anything. LeBron probably working harder now than he was 20 years ago. Why? Because he's older. <laughs> his body ain't the same. He's working harder now. He's spending millions of dollars to keep his body conditioned. Saunas, cold plunges, massages acupuncture the best uh therapist them 48 minutes in the game is harder than them 48 minutes was when he first came in the league them knees ain't the same you think they paid him all the millions if he wasn't out there busting his ass no diddy Let's let's go back to the box truck. Let's take let's ask somebody uh who's current. Let's look at Kirk. Kirk is a, a one man owner operator. You know he his strategy is he goes one week on, one week off. He's out there away from his family. He's working hard. Let's segue into something else. I put a lot of time on this YouTube channel. I didn't build up the subscriber base that I built up without putting the time and the effort in. Even though most of it is pro bono, I still put time and effort in. It's work. When you see me on those six-hour live streams on them call-in shows talking to these people, y'all be saying it in the chat and in the comments like, man, Mark, you patient, man. Huh? Man, ha man, salute. Me trying to get it through these knuckleheads that you got to work hard in order to be successful, to build a business, that's work. You think Obama, when he was the president, he didn't work? You think he didn't work prior to becoming the president? Should we keep going? Should we keep going? Y'all want to start talking about some of these big CEOs? Not Bill Gates. Because Bill Gates, he's he's entitled. He doesn't, he doesn't understand how Bill Gates bought everything. He bought technology. He didn't build nothing. 
Let's talk about some of the CEOs that actually built some things. Jeff Bezos, you got to give it to him. There is vintage footage of him in the 90s in that garage building Amazon. Hard work. The early days of Elon Musk and PayPal, hard work. Warren Buffett, hard work. R.I.P. Steve Jobs, hard work. Scaranch, the founder and CEO of uh, Rivian. I've been trying to get that off the ground since... 2012, 2013, 2011, hard work. Vitalik Buterin, hard work. Charles Hoskinson, some of y'all know who I'm talking about. Still hard work. Still working hard. I mean, every successful person that I've come across, I've read their story. Sam Walton. Like, when you see this asset over liability shit, like, how do you get the assets without hard work? In order to be able to get an asset, to be able to leverage that asset, to acquire another asset, to get the original asset, you got to start with hard work. Most people who have some type of real estate portfolio, they usually start with one property. Some type of work had to come in in order to come up with the funds to purchase that one property. And when they had that one property, they had to continue to work to acquire another property. Once they got so many properties, then they started leveraging those properties to get to other properties, to get more properties, until those properties were paying enough that said individual could stop doing what they were doing in initially, which is their active income, in which they acquired their first piece of property to build uh, a successful uh, real estate portfolio to be able to remove themselves from whatever job or career they had because now their tenants are funding their lifestyle but it had to come with hard work this is now i see where and, and why it's not just that one individual but I, I i wanted when i seen it i wanted to show you this is the narrative that's being pushed it's not him you got the assets over liability, leisure, whatever they guys is. People read Robert Kiyosaki and they misconstrue it. Yes. Acquire more assets. Acquire less liabilities. Use your assets to acquire more assets. But guess what? In order to acquire assets, you need capital. In order to get capital, you need to work. As you work and you build your business and you scale your business and you invest into other things that are giving you more income, call it passive income or whatever, you're gaining knowledge. Now you have capital. Capital equals resources. You can use those resources or that capital to acquire other resources. Now you can outsource. Now thinking smart comes into play. You know what? We have enough revenue coming in that I can hire someone in between me and the employees 
to run the business and that person report to me. I have an extra couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm able to pay somebody a hundred thousand dollars to be a liaison in between me and the employees. In order to get to that level, you got to work hard so that you can build up the resources and the capital to be able to pay that person so that you can work smart. Now you're working smarter. A lot of people ain't going to come into the business with the knowledge of a five or a 10 or a 20 year vet. Initially, you, they learning as they go. And as they learning, they working. And as they working, they learning. They're acquiring the knowledge by actually doing the work. I, 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 I don't get it, man. But now I know. And this is why when I come do what I do on YouTube, why my job is hard. Because I have to combat shit like that. Because when people hear that and then they listen to me, obviously that's going to seem more appealing. And I get it. It seems more appealing. Everybody want to get something for nothing. But trust me. If something was nothing, then everybody would have it. Now, don't let that go over your head. If something was nothing, then everybody would have it. If it was so easy, everybody would be doing it. If it was so easy, everybody would have it. If it was so easy, why is the failure rate as high as it is? Think about that. If it was so easy, why is the failure rate so high? Mm. Now that touched somebody, didn't it? That, that touched somebody, didn't it? Listen, man. Listen. People got to use common sense, man. Like, here we are, 2024, and I, I, I and people still spend it. But I, I get it, man. I get it. It's easier to, to, to say shit like that, you know, so people can buy into whatever it is people selling. And I'm just speaking in general now. It's easier to market a narrative so that People can sell products. So. So it is what it is, man. I I I'm just not gonna sit up here and lie. You know, um, I'm not going to sit up here and sell, send people off. I'm not going to sell people a dream. I'm going to tell them what to expect. You can like it. You don't got to like it. You can listen. You don't got to listen. But guess what? You always end up coming back over here. Because what you thought was easy, it wasn't easy. And then you're going to have to come over here. And then we're going to have to hold you accountable. Because you thought it was easy. And you didn't want to work hard. Shout out to uh, Arturo. Thank you for making your course affordable. No problem, man. No problem, man. The um, you must be talking about the box truck business plan. What is it? Twenty twenty four dollars. <laughs> the, the 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 point is to get the information out. It, it's never to profit. It covers the the website maintenance and the fees for the website. And that's it. As long as it covers that, then that's the only thing I'm concerned about. I want you to have it. I want people to have it. I understand, you know, so I've always been for the people since day one. So, um, so no, you don't, I appreciate you. Um, 
Tyler Perry is from New Orleans, and he was homeless, living in his car as well as Dwayne Johnson, who just had five dollars to his name, and he played. Yeah, a lot of a lot of success stories come from humble beginnings. A lot of success stories coming from humble beginnings. Listen, the only people who can start businesses without hard work are people that are entitled that have resources. Point blank, period, man. Point blank, period. Listen, listen. <laughs> If you don't have resources, if you don't have capital to be able to put, this is thinking smart when started a business. You smart. This is a smarty pants starting a business. No knowledge of a business. You have an idea for a business. You want to start it. You don't know what the hell you're doing, but you got the money. So you employ somebody who does know what they're doing to build a business for you while you sit back and do nothing. If you don't have capital, then you can't do that. And 99.8% of the people can't do that. Can't do it. I damn sure wouldn't do it for a box truck business. If I was a gazillionaire and I wanted to start a box, first of all, if I was a gazillionaire, I wouldn't be thinking about starting a box truck business, right? But think about it. Let's think about it. Box truck business. Let's let's really deep dive analysis. Box truck business. Is there a way to start a box truck business? A successful box truck business. Without having to deal with a third party. Is there is there any way that someone can name me how to start a box truck business without dealing with a third party? Paul Smith, you're welcome. Brian Webb got it moving. And there are third parties. You can there are moving brokers, but you really don't need them. All right. So, so moving. All right. So let's say Mark wanted to come in in 2024 and start a box truck business. Right. But Mark don't know shit about box truck business. Right. But I hire somebody. And then they come back to me and they say, Mark. And then this is I want the people that are watching me that that's that's looking to get into the business. This is how I want you to. This is I'm finna give you the information that you would have to go look for yourself because I know you're not going to do it because you never do it. And even if you did do it, you're not going to go this deep. I go hire a consultant. Look, I'm Marky Mark. I'm big dog, man. You know me. I'm, I got 500 million. Let's say I want to start me a box truck business. I saw some videos on YouTube and they had, they said this box truck business thing, they said, man, people making gazillion dollars a year at one box truck. So, man, I got $500 million, man. Skip it. We can get a thousand of them things. So, I'm hiring you as a consultant. I need you to let me know. Tell me everything I need to know about the box truck business. I'm paying you $500 an hour. I mean, all right, so boom. So, first thing, they're going to look at the lanes. Well, okay, if you want to start a box truck business, uh well you're gonna hire these guys running off the load board you got a direct shipper it'd probably be wide for you to get a direct shipper and you can run the loads direct okay uh another option would be uh final mile but guess what you know you're gonna have to have enough drivers and enough trucks spread out throughout the country in order for us to go pitch to home depot or in order for us to go pitch to Lowe's. Or other for us to go pitch the best buy. That's why they go through three PLs because it's more cost effective to just contract it out. So that idea would be out the way. This is for all you guys that want to come into the box truck business with your hopes and dreams of coming in without really doing nothing. All right, so that's out the way. So I really wouldn't. It wouldn't really be worth my while. Nah. Mm -mm. From what our findings, Mark, it'll probably just be best to start a brokerage firm. 
That way you just you'd have a company and be a bunch of middlemen that are working off commission, selling loads to these guys for pennies on a dollar. You cut your risk, cut your expense. Why you want to deal with trucks, maintenance, drivers, attitudes, they trucks? Like, why you want to deal with that? No, nah, we just started a better idea in our findings. Just start a brokerage firm. You're rich. You're rubbing shoulders with all the people. You know the CEO of Best Buy. You know the CEO of, 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 of Home Depot. You know this guy over here. You know that guy over there. We know this guy who knows that guy who knows that guy. And we'll just tell him. One of our friends is starting a brokerage firm and we want to run everything through that company, through your company. Oh, that makes more sense. So, yeah, we so we can have the brokers in there. We'll pay them a commission for selling the loads and then, you know, we'll sell them to the and then we, we got we're using our 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 relationships with the shippers. We're getting our money off the top before anybody eats. We'll let the. The, the 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 brokers fight over the commission and we'll let the truckers fight over the loads. And we'll make money off our relationships. That's thinking smart. Coming into a business. That's thinking smart. That's thinking smart. That's leveraging relationships. That's using your resources with your money to make shit happen without doing hard work. Making phone calls. Yo, hey, I'm starting a brokerage firm. Yeah, I heard you was at Diddy's party. One of my, one of my, one of my, one of my associates be seeing you at the Diddy party. I ain't at the Diddy party, but you know, Y'all be at the Diddy party with one of my associates and I was just wondering, he gave me your number and I was wondering if, you know, you know, I got this company that started, you know, so we want to start this brokerage firm and, you know, we need those accounts. We want you to run it through us. Hey, I, I heard about what you, how you be doing at them Diddy party. Your, your secret's safe with me. I'm just letting you know I heard. I'm not saying I'm going to tell nobody. This is how real deals get done. And if they ain't getting done that way, they getting done on a golf course. But guess what? A person who can start a business from scratch, that was my example of a person starting a business from scratch. It was a humorous uh, 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 example, but sh shit like that happens. People with money, man, they work smart like that. They use their relationships. They leverage their relationships. They use their capital to hire people that are smarter than them to do shit for them. See, a lot of people that come into this, they think they get in these mentorships. They're hiring people smarter than them to get the information. Duh, that's stupid. The real way you should do it, smart guy, the real way rich people do it, right? They pay people to do this shit for them. They hire people that are smarter than them to build this shit for them. <laughs> What's his name from Microsoft? Man, he didn't build shit. He don't know how to, he don't even know how to write code. He doesn't even know how to write code. We got the most popular PC software available. Government contracts with the government. Can't write a lick of code. What does he do? He hires people. They're smarter than him, but he has the resources to do so. Bill Gates. If you don't got the resources, then guess what, buddy? You're going to be doing a lot of hard work. Sorry to tell you.
Sorry to tell you. Paul Smith, exactly. Less liabilities. If I wanted to get into trucking, let's say trucking, not cargo van. Let's say if I was looking in trucking, I think the easiest route would be to start a brokerage. Just moving loads, connecting dots. That's it. Send a salesperson out. We get an account. The brokers move it. They get a commission. You put it on your truck. The liability is on you at that point. Oh, nothing fall on the brokers. Just like the 3PL. 3PL don't own no trucks. They send salespeople out to these different corporations. They present a presentation. This is why you should go with T-Force to move all your appliances nationwide. We have the biggest footprint. We have the most warehouses strategically located off all major highways and byways. We have the largest network of, of, of independent contractors. Blah, blah, blah. The salesperson goes and flies to Dallas down to T-Force's corporate headquarters. They put on a presentation. T-Force decides to go with them because they put on a great presentation and their bid came in slightly lower than the other company that put on another presentation, let's say XPO or RxO. They get the account. They have a bunch of independent owner operators actually doing the labor, they own no trucks. Home Depot pays T-Force. T-Force pays you. You go into someone's home, you break something, you damage something, they call the store. Uh, uh, Home Depot said, well, shit, we didn't go in there. We putting it on T-Force. T-Force said, well, shit, we didn't go in there. You the independent contractor. It's in, our, it's in the contract that if you break it, you bought it. So we putting it on you. We don't own the truck. We not responsible for the liability of these people's homes you going in. We not responsible for the shit once you take it off the dock and put it on your truck. If you scratch it, if you nick it, if you ding it, it's on you. We hold no liability. We get paid because we flew somebody out to Dallas on a corporate dime who was a good salesperson who gets paid off a commission to go sell and they went and sold their ass off and they brought back a multi-million dollar nationwide delivery contract that we're just going to reap the benefits from but hold no liability that's smart They have resources. Yeah, resources, though. <sighs> I'm asking a few questions. Hello, how's everyone doing tonight? Axel has been depressed. That's why he ain't been putting out no content. He, uh, he, uh, he ain't had no motivation. Uh, uh, let's see. Great investor that sets my whole play GTA granted to becoming an asset manager. Um, Elon Musk sold PayPal. Got like 80 million, need to help with rent a few months. Yep. Elon Musk is another testament. I think I named Elon Musk with PayPal. Elon Musk worked very, very hard to be where he is today. You know, he, he can play smart now because he got the capital. He can spend that capital on people who are smart to build ideas for him. Whatever ideas he wants to come to life, he can hire smart people to do it for him. He may not have 
the knowledge, but there's people out there that do, and he can afford to pay them. So, but he had to do hard work initially to be able to come with the, to, to, in order to be able to acquire the capital that he has now to be able to work smart. Uh, uh, you can make smart decisions, work effectively for your business, but it requires work. Definitely requires work. I mean, even the Bible says faith without works is faith without works is dead. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, James chapter two, verse 14, go look it up. Faith without works is dead. James chapter two, verse 14. Like, uh, I don't know. You know, maybe he's entitled. Maybe he's entitled. I don't know. He's probably entitled. Well, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe he's entitled. <laughs> you never know. Uh, if you're an employee, work smart, not hard, unless there's a financial incentive to. If you're an employee on an hourly pay, you get paid the same, no matter how productive you are. Work for yourself is different. Exactly. It's basically everything, like you said, that I've been saying, is what you said, you know. And here's the thing, and I say it all the time. Listen, because I know it's people out there that's looking to get into the business that's watching. Contrary to what you're told on other channels, on Instagram, from these other content creators that want you to buy their courses and shit like that, when you start a business, you're going to work harder for yourself than, than what you did when you worked for a company. And there's no way, you know, if you're, you can go work and to, you can go to work and you know what to do, just enough to do just to get back for that day. You just might not be feeling all that great. You might have a stomach ache, but you know how to go in there and play it off and bullshit, but just do enough just to get through the day. When you own a business, you can't do that. If your stomach hurt, and you can't work, then you're not going to get paid. If your tummy hurt, you're going to have to go to work and thug it out. You're going to have to go to work and thug it out. There's no PTO. You're going to have to thug it out, man. You're going to work harder for yourself. Every decision, you got to make it. There's no... uh um managers above you that you can relate issues to from 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 your job for them to problem solve for you you are the problem solver every single problem that comes through that business through your business is your job to solve you are a small business owner so you are 100 percent right you are going to work harder so Ah, I, I don't know, man. You know, conversations like this, man, they, they just depress me, man. I just wish, you know, people coming into business, uh, you know, uh, made more sound decisions. I wish people coming into business, you know, exercise common sense a little bit more. Um, they do more deep dive analysis on the information that they consume. Um, because when I come up here and I have to, like, when I do these calling shows, like, Joe, trust me, I'm telling you, I be having headaches, man, afterwards. Like, when I go to sleep after that shit, I be in, like, a deep, depressed sleep. Like, it really upsets me, man. Right? It upsets me. Um, and I don't know why it upsets me. You know what I'm saying? Because... <laughs> It's not me, you know what I'm saying? But I think I think part of it is uh, my desire to want to get through to people, but you know, you know, because I'm like not really I'm in the algorithm, but I'm not really in the algorithm like that. So you know, when people find me, you know, they they find me after they've been through other people and now I have to unlearn their their mindset from what they've already been consuming. And that I think is what is the biggest challenge for me and 
when I be up here trying to do it, like y'all see it, like I don't give up on these people. I really be trying to break through to these people and that shit be killing me, man. It be killing me, man. So, um, but man, I'm not gonna give up, man. I'm gonna keep doing it until I see somewhat of a breakthrough or until YouTube puts me in the, in the algorithm a little bit more to the point where I'm, 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 I'm competing in the algorithm a little bit better to kind of make things a little bit easier for me. Um, uh, you said you only do that when you want to push your video to a particular person's attention. What do you mean, Axel? What do you mean? Oh, you talking about him. You talking about him, not you. So, I mean, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, I mean, here's the thing, man. He's a, I, you know, I don't think. <laughs> if if it was anybody that I would want to do better, it would be him. To be honest with you, and the reason why is. Uh, I guess because he's older, you know, I don't, you know, when I challenge him, you know, I, I challenge him to do better as far as the information, you know, I don't nitpick like you see other people do with him or disrespect him or anything. I, I challenge him about the information, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know what I'm saying? It, because the, the information is what people are consuming and you don't want to mislead anybody or give people the wrong interpretation on things, but you know, most people that watch the content in the space come from humble, humble beginnings. Like, you know, to, 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 to say, you know, just think about it. You know, most people work jobs and they have to go get a second of what they got a first of a second job. So think about it. If you had to go get a second, that means the first one ain't working. So you're going to get a second of something that wasn't working the first. Like that shit don't even make sense to me. You know, I, I you know, I can, you know, I, I remember growing up, my, my OG, she worked, uh, obviously she taught during the day. Then she worked the after school program. And then during summer, she taught summer school. So she didn't even really get, she got like a month off. You know, summer school was six weeks. She taught the six weeks. Why? She made all the extra money that she could. It wasn't the fact that her uh, salary wasn't, it, it, it wasn't, work, wasn't working. It just wasn't enough. You know, if, 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 if a person is willing to go above and beyond to further ensure a more comfortable living for their family. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, you know, that situation is just, you know, I would just, I just expect more out of him. You know what I'm saying? That's why I, I'm, I'm upset about that. I just expect more out of him. You know, I think he makes good content as far as the editing side. You know, I challenge him on information sometimes and there's nothing wrong with friendly debate you know, educational debate, you know, I'm always keep it educational, but that right there, I just thought it was, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I would expect more out of him, you know, so, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I would never think someone would say, oh, well, if the first one ain't working, that shit don't even make sense, <laughs> don't make sense. So to the, the 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 person that's out there right now that worked a nine to five and then got off work and then went on and put on a security uniform to go work four hours, they hundred thousand dollars a year. That wasn't working, no, it's just not enough. Or to most police officers moonlight. You got police officers say they're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and then they go moonlight on their off days or go moonlight after they shift at Walmart for six hours 
of four hours. Or they go moonlight at Foot Locker. They go moonlight doing security at night at a nightclub checking IDs. Is there, is, is, is there, is, it's not working? That 100000 whatever they sell is not working? Nah. And that may not even be the fact that it's not enough. They just want to make more money. Some people work two jobs because they want to make more money. I just thought it was ignorant, man. I just thought it was ignorant. You know, so, so I, I, you know, not, not, that's it. I mean, you can, uh, uh, and you know, I don't know. I just expect more from him. I just thought that was, you know, a little ignorant, but it's all, it's all good. All right. So, um, what time is it? Ooh, it's eight o'clock. I've been on for a minute. Yeah. Uh, I've been on for a minute. I thought it was maybe like seven. Yeah, I was running my mouth. All right, so I think we'll do. Uh, he said this is all about survival. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's all about survival. Listen, here, here's something that I can say on that before I get up out of here too. Me personally, I would never say no shit like that. All right, here's why. One thing. And this person is old enough to know this. He's older than me. All right. So if you look at the job market, if you look at a chart, I wonder if I could pull one up. If you look at a chart and you compare the job market wages over the past 20 years and you compare it or you parallel it to the rate of inflation, I'm pretty sure you're going to see that parallel start to go like that. So if it's paralleling, if it's paralleling, uh, let's, let's bring this up. If it's paralleling, let's say you got uh inflation and this is the inflation line no you know what let's say this is uh uh let's do wages let's do wages so this is wages and then let's do Inflation. And this represents inflation. All right, that's the key. Blue is inflation, red is uh, wages. And let's say this is 2000. And let's say this is 2000, uh, 2024. All right. 2024 all right i'm pretty sure without me going and looking i'm gonna go look right now and see if it's a a, a, a chart wages and the rate of a parallel chart with wages and the rate of inflation and i guarantee you wages aren't keeping up with the rate of inflation all right long are the days where a father can go out uh, work a job, have a stay-at-home wife, pump four kids into her, have four snotty-nosed kids, all, you know, back-to-back -back in age, under 10, let's say. Wife stays at home, and he can go work at the mill. He can go work at the, 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 the plant, the steel mill, the factory, be able to buy a house, pay the mortgage, food, clothes, shelter, and have a car and get them back and forth to work off that one salary. That day did once exist. The boomers. That era. The 50s. The 40s, the 60s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. 
that era, that time existed. It doesn't exist anymore. I didn't start hearing multiple streams of revenue promoted so heavily until like maybe five or six years ago. To me, it, it, that term, not to say it didn't exist, obviously it's existed. But it wasn't highly publicized like it's been like the past five years. Why? Because you need multiple streams of in income now to maintain some type of quality of life. We went through the era where both the husband and the wife had to work. Okay, now you got two incomes coming in the house, the 80s. The 90s, the 2000s. So as things went up, now, okay, wife got to get out and go work. Now we're in an era because wages aren't keeping up with the rate of inflation that even with the husband and the wife working, they still need more income. We saw a testament of that. If you guys caught the Mark and Axel show late Saturday night, we did a late pop-up show Saturday night. Why did that turn black? I guess that's a, I must got a night thing or something. All right, boom. We did a late pop-up show Saturday night, went to two in the morning, but we had, we opened the floor for people to call in. A guy called in for those people that watched it or didn't watch it. Guy works. He owns a home in New York, a very expensive market to live in. Owns a home in, I think he said the Bronx. His wife works. She's a New York public school teacher. He works for the city of New York Metro as an engineer or a mechanic. So he fixes the buses and the trains. So he works for the city, she works for the city. They own a home in the Bronx. She drives an X6, he drives a 645, 650. He has a third car as his, you know, as his Lolo. They got three kids. Now, I know that here in Chicago, you know, the, the city job back in the day, if you got hired with the city, you was winning. Listen, if you got hired with City of Chicago back in the 90s to the 2000s, you were winning. The 80s, my old man worked for the, the City of Chicago in the 80s. If you got on with the City, you winning. He works for the City of New York. She works for the City of New York. To me, that Instagram shit people put up, goals, couple goals, to me, that's goals. But guess what? In today's times, two people in one single household that both work for the largest city in this country is not enough. So how can somebody tell a person if, if, if the job, the nine to five ain't working, you go out and get a second of what wasn't working like, that's a bad thing. No, nah, you got to do what you got to do now. So you shame somebody because they doing what they got to do? The whole purpose of him wanting to come up here that day is because he's trying to think of other things to do to bring in more revenue. And I asked him, I'm like, why do you want to do this, man? You need it? You need the extra income? Yeah, we need the extra income. Let me see if I can find a chart for wages versus inflation rate chart. Let's see if we can find one. Uh, 2024. Let's see if we can find a chart. I 
I want to find the chart, man. Hold on, is this one? Inflation. If somebody found a chart versus way a wage inflation chart. Current dollars, times and dollars. Good person power has hardly budge. Man, hold on. I'm gonna find one. Man, here go one for 2019. I need a current one. Uh, let's go to 2023. I need a current one though. I need a current one. How we got any earnings? Inflation. Yeah, I need a, I need a, I need a current one. Man, I'm gonna have to find one, man. I don't want to spend too much time researching, but I'm gonna look for a wage versus inflation chart, and we're gonna do a compare and contrast. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now this is for 2023, but we already know it's higher now. All right, here we go. Let me share it. All right, so orange represents inflation. Uh, blue represents wage growth. All right, so obviously we saw the pandemic hit 2020. All right, we got wages in the blue. All right. You see, as going into 2021, you see the slopes going up, comes down. 2021, it continues to go up. 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 It came down right here where you see my cursor is when the federal government last year, uh, well, when they started to ease the rates because remember they was going up with the, um, the interest rates, right? To cool off the economy, you start to see the rates come down, right? You start to see the rates come down, right? But we're still high, right? Because we need to be at a 2%. But now look at the wages. Wages have been pretty stagnant for years. We talked about that the other day. Most states, state minimum wage is the same now that it was back in the 2000s, right? So now when you see inflation, boom, and wages go up, right? You just saw them go up to $20 an hour in California right for fast food the fast food sector but still the wages have gone up but they haven't gone up with the same rate of inflation so if inflation shoots up and wages go up just to kind of meet the demand because people you know have to make more money to 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 be able to live and they have to pay more in order to be able to retain people but this blue line ain't up here where this orange line is at that means these people, people in general, rather, are spending a lot more money for the same shit that they was buying over here when they were making more money than the current rate of inflation. Inflation is higher than the wages. But you got this guy over there talking about hard work. And if, you know, the, the, the one thing ain't working, why go out and get a second thing of what weren't working in the first place? And see, this is what I say when you say shit, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, man. You never know who's watching. Saying stuff just to sound like you smart and the shit ain't smart don't even make sense without doing the research. Even if you don't know what the hell you talking about, do some research before you do content so you don't look crazy. Especially when you got a guy like me who builds his content for box trucking based around the economy and economics. Fuck, fuck not even knowing what the hell you're talking about. The man eat. A trip to the grocery store ain't the same as a trip to the grocery store in 2019. When does common sense kick in that the reason why people are going out and having to get two and three jobs is because their income isn't taking them as far as it used to.
Google is your best friend. But you see people, they are gyms, 100. I always say, man, you can't look at the bad side of things. If you're looking at something, if you if you're doing something and it's not cutting it, I always say, well, shit, you gotta make more money then. If if what you was doing ain't cutting it no more, you gotta make more money. So if a person goes out and makes more money. How can you spit in their face? How can you shit on them? When we when I'm looking at a graph where inflation has surpassed wage growth. This is why people are working two and three jobs. So you don't shit on people. Because they're facing economical challenges, economical challenges. You commend them for going out doing what they have to do to get through whatever it is they're going through. I, I yeah, that shit, man. <laughs> What are y'all talking about? Uh, yep. So that that's why people are working multiple jobs. So there's nothing wrong with hard work. If you gotta work hard to attain, you know, a comfortable way of life, then so be. If you need to work hard to get you to where you need to get to, so that you can then utilize your capital, your resources to branch off into other things and so be it you know just you know consume information don't let the information consume you do your own due diligence and use common sense i'm gonna say that in part uh all right the more they turn on the money printer the more it's going to drive inflation up i agree but but check this out As a box truck owner operator, really think about this. I want you to really think about this. I'm going to lead you to think about this. Would it be in your best interest for the rates to go down or to stay where they at? I want you to think about it. Mark, are we going to Dalton? No. Why, why would I go to Dalton, man? Why would I go to Dalton? I don't care about Tiffany Henyard. I don't care about what's going on out in Dalton. I don't live in Dalton. I live in Chicago. Dalton is a suburb right outside of Chicago. That shit that's going on in Dalton is Dalton's problem. I don't know why all these other content creators are flying all the way from middle America to go to the board meetings and with their little camera phone so they can get content and make money off of it. You see what happened to a Monday, the one black guy they got on his ass, the white guy they got on his ass. Like, listen, why would you come to a city, a, a town right outside of Chicago? Just because it's in the suburb, but it's still right outside of Chicago. These people will get on your ass. These people will get on your ass. Why would I go to Dalton? That ain't my business. That's why I be saying, man, like if I really wanted to be a, a re, like a content creator for, for, for monetary gain, it's plenty of content here. I can go to Dalton every Monday and just sit there and, and, and stream the board meetings and we'll have thousands and thousands of people. This guy flew here from Oklahoma, Long Island artists flew here from New York. You got this guy, Hannibal. He's restreaming. He's in New York. All these guys are creating content off Tiffany Henyard and they don't even live here. 
It's to the point now when they go to these board meetings, the people there is getting on their ass, right? But that's not my business. I'm not here to make a check off of YouTube. I'm really here to help people. I talked about the shooting last night and I put it on private. I just wanted to to talk about it. And I talked about it. I had dialogue with Costas and uh, uh, D-Walk and I showed the video for other people that didn't get a chance to see it from different angles because the news only showed a clip from one angle, but I have access to uh, all the body cams. I'm a Chicago resident. So I was able to pull up uh, uh, the uh, the body cam footage. I talked about it. Me and Costas talked from, you know, a, 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 a Chicago uh, perspective from, to another Chicago perspective from another Chicago perspective, from two people who grew up on two different sides of town. And once we had that dialogue, I uh, I put it on private. I didn't look to monetize it. I just wanted to have dialogue. I don't cover uh, the, sh the gang shit here, the drill shit here. I don't cover Brandon Johnson. I don't cover the migrant shit. I don't cover all this content that all these creators make millions of dollars off of that don't live here, I could easily get this shit, but I don't do it. I come on here to talk box trucking and that's what I do. You know, I'm not going to Dalton. That ain't got shit to do with me. Um, Axel, uh, that's Dalton's problem. Let them figure that shit out. <laughs> Let them figure that out. I'll just watch it from the stream like everybody else. Even though I can go watch it up close and personal, I just watch it on YouTube. Because I can tell you what's going to happen in a, in a hot second. After watching that mean Monday, it's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. And then you can pretty much paint the picture of what happens next. So why would I want to go out there? It uh, ain't my fight. Um, uh. I'm in the exposed business. Good content for me. Yeah, see, I'm not in that type of business. I think in that 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 type of exposed business, I think it comes with repercussions. See, here's the thing. A lot of people that's in that exposed business, they don't understand that. See, a lot of people that get in that business, they think they can do it from the privacy of their own home behind their computer. All right. But here's the thing. People will get up with you. We saw that Monday with the Long Island audit coming here to do the Dalton content. We saw that with the guy from Oklahoma. They put them people on him. This is Chicago, bro. You gonna come here, you gonna live stream some shit and they know you monetizing it. You not from here. And you think you're just going to walk in and continue to walk in and continue to walk in and, and they not going to get on your ass? This ain't middle America. So the exposed business is okay, but, you know, it's, 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 it, it, can, it can get dangerous too. You never know what resources people you have. A lot of people... And a lot of these cases that get um, highlighted for some of these videos, a lot of times that shit don't even be true. It just be narratives or people not liking a person for a specific reason, so they spin a narrative. I'm not in the exposed business. That's why I won't go out to Dalton and cover Tiffany Henyard. I don't pay taxes in Dalton. I don't even party in Dalton. I used to go to a club called Secrets back in the day. The Chicago people that's in here, they probably know it. I used to frequent Dalton back, Dalton back in the day when Secrets was open. I know somebody that owned a club in Dalton. You know what I'm saying? But since Secrets been gone, I haven't really frequented Dalton like that. But I have no business out in Dalton. So I don't be out there like that. But, uh, uh, yeah, rest in peace, OJ. 
Uh, the lab tomorrow will probably be maybe early, like maybe four, four or five. Actually, stay here and worry about them goons. Well, actually, if you come to Chicago, then you got to make sure you let me know because I'm going to have to accompany you, bro. I don't want nobody saying, man, Axel was out there in Chicago. Mark, why you didn't hold him down? Well, let, let me know if you're going to come, Axel. I, I, that'll be the only day I'll I, I come out there to, to make sure you straight. But other than that, I'm not going out there. All right, I, I ain't kicked it with y'all enough, man. I'm tired, man. I'm finna go watch BMF. Is BMF on? I'm finna go watch BMF and uh make me a uh uh. He said Mark keep him in Elmhurst, man. Axel ain't coming out here, man. Mark, what's the most expensive piece of furniture you and your team has ever moved? I, th I talked about it. It was a, a Ralph Lauren armoire. That's the most expensive piece of furniture that I've known that we moved because the customer told me what it was and how much he spent for it. So it was a Ralph Lauren armoire. It was a vintage Ralph Lauren armoire. I don't think Ralph Lauren makes furniture anymore, but it was um, when we moved it, it was like 20 years old at that point. And this was like 10 years ago maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago. So um, it was a Ralph Lauren armoire from like 1990 and he said he paid 20 grand for it. Um, this was a surgeon. He was a well-off surgeon. We moved him, big house, four or five car indoor garage. You know, the, the garage had, you know, epoxy floor, real shiny epoxy floor. Um, and he had a really beautiful home, probably one of the nicest homes that I've ever been in. Really huge walk-in closet. Like that was the biggest walk-in closet. That was the first biggest walk-in closet I had ever been to in my life. Like the big walk-in closet with the island in the middle of the closet where you could set your stuff up with the mirrors all around with the racks and then you, in that walk-in closet, you could walk into another walk. It was huge, man. But yeah, he had a twenty thousand dollar Ralph Lauren armoire. So now, if we move something else, or if I move something else that was more expensive than that, I wouldn't have known because I didn't inquire or the customers didn't tell me. That was that was told to me uh, because he he said, "Look, man, I care about everything, but I care about this the most because it's, it's it's not replace. I can't replace it. It's irreplaceable. They don't they don't make it. They don't sell it anymore." It's a twenty thousand dollar Ralph Lauren armoire, so that's that's the most expensive thing offhand that I know that I've I've ever moved. Uh, and now, how much uh, protection? So we we wrapped it from top to bottom, right? Uh, we used the thickest blankets they sell, one hundred and twenty five pound for a dozen blankets, the real thick. They look like silk on the outside. They're real shiny, thick, heavy blankets, which actually makes the damn thing heavier. Wrapped it up. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many blankets we used, but just knowing the size of it, we had to use maybe about eight to 10 blankets for that thing. We had to use probably about eight to 10 blankets. It's because we figured two on the bottom, uh, one on each side, that's four. Uh, two in the front, that's six, two in the back, so like eight, eight to 10 blankets. Eight to 10 blankets. Eight to 10 blankets, Um, had to strap it, lift it, put it on the four-wheeler, rolled it out. <sighs> um, Unfortunately, back then, I didn't have a lift gate on that truck, so we had to walk it up the ramp, and that was hectic. That was hectic, so, uh, but yep. What's up, what up, what up, what up, what up? Ralph Lauren did make furniture back in the day. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, Ralph Lauren armoire. Uh, it wasn't none of these. 
it was a long piece of furniture. The vintage Ralph Lauren mahogany two-piece armoire, 3200. Huge Ralph Lauren Safari Collection hardwood television cabinet, $5,000. This is huge. This is stuff is vintage. This stuff is about 30, 30 years old, and they still want 6000 for it. Well, he told me he paid 20000 The one he had was more longer than it was tall. But yep. Yep. You, you know what's funny? <laughs> I said the same thing when he told me that. I was like, damn, Ralph Lauren make furniture? But when I thought about it, when he said it, uh, we didn't have Macy's here growing up. We had a store called Marshall Fields, uh, which actually Macy's ended up buying. And the, the Ralph Lauren section did sell furniture and stuff back in the day when I thought about it. They, I mean, now they don't sell, you know what, the Ralph Lauren store downtown, I don't know, I haven't been in it, but the Ralph Lauren outlets, I haven't seen furniture. I need to go into the Ralph Lauren store down down on Michigan Avenue and see if they have a furniture section. But I know they sell home goods, like in Macy's, they sell Ralph Lauren pillows, because I purchased like Ralph Lauren pillows, obviously Ralph Lauren bed spreads. But yeah, back in the day, uh, Ralph Lauren sold furniture. So... Uh, uh, his house, I can't remember what it was worth. I did look it up back in the day, but uh, uh I, believe it or not, um, the reason why he was moving out because he lost it. It was a foreclosure. Yep, he lost it. So I think due to a divorce, if I can remember correctly but yeah we were moving him out because he lost the house the wife showed up with her new boyfriend too while we were on the move it was crazy man it was crazy yep that's when we found out that he was that the house was under foreclosure that they was just walking away from it or whatever or whatever she showed up with a new boyfriend it was uh, um he was like a pakistanian or something like a indian guy and the wife was like a white model looking chick with, you know, fake boobs and shit like that. She looked really good. Looked like she she looked like she was with him because he had the bread. He didn't look like he was supposed to be with her, but she looked like she looked like she was with him because of the bread. Right? And cause the guy she came in with <clears throat> was closer to what you would think a chick like her would be like. He was tall, you know, you know athletic and shit like that and then this guy was like a scrungy older surgeon so the house was under foreclosure um i can't remember what it was worth but it was under foreclosure um yeah so uh all right uh, did you see that vintage Jordan graphic bomber jacket that sold on eBay for something like thirty five hundred? I believe it was Travis Kelsey who bought it. Nah, Jordan graphic bomber jacket. Nah, I must have missed that one. Uh, all right, y'all. I'll catch y'all either tomorrow or uh Saturday for the Collins show. All right. Be careful out there. Continue to work hard. Don't let nobody tell you otherwise. Peace.